cervical ADR not appropriate. And I think the main issue that I see is when the disc space is severely collapsed. If a motion segment is already almost fused, I think those are very difficult cases. Not saying that you can't do an artificial disc in those cases, but I think those cases are the ones that are the most challenging where I don't, I'm not really sure if I see any benefit of trying to mobilize that disc. Um, most of the devices now are five millimeters to six millimeters in height. And so you really have to be cognizant of that because you have to preserve the end plate. And I think the most crucial difference between ADR and fusion is the fact that you have to pay attention to the end plate. And so typically with fusions, we're very used to burring out the end plate. So if it's a collapsed disc, we can get a five millimeter implant in because we can take two to three millimeters off the end plate. And I think most of these artificial discs, since they are truly prosthesis, they're going to be functioning for the lifespan of the patient. That has to rest on that end plate, and that end plate is a functioning mechanical portion of this motion segment. And for that reason, you really have to take care of the end plate and not destroy it. Um, so those are the things that I really look for. I think you really have to look at implant size versus the disc space size. Um, what I'd like to say is, is that each end plate or each artificial disc also offers a little bit of different end plate geometry. So some artificial discs, you're trying to make the end plate a little bit more flat. Some, are fi art some, sorry, some artificial discs, the disc plates are more domed. And therefore, you really need to be cognizant of that and try to figure out how to preserve the end plate the best to match your artificial disc. I think that is the main um, issue that I look at when I look at artificial disc. I think it now even becomes more important now that we're getting to multiple levels artificial disc. So obviously with carrier approval, we're seeing a lot more two-level artificial disc. And now that we see two-level artificial disc, I think that those end plate requirements are even more substantial. If you're going to place an artificial disc at two levels, and if you take the end plate at the level above and the level below, that middle vertebral body can get very, very narrow and small, and that vertebral body has a risk of subsiding if you have an artificial di disc above and below. And therefore, I think even with, um, even when we start doing multi-level artificial discs, you have to even be more cognizant of the end plate. And so that I think is the, I think the other uh, points I'd like to make with artificial disc is, is that you have to pay attention to the facet joints. So I do think that we do a lot of artificial disc and I would say mildly um, arthritic facet joints. I, I do think that that's very reasonable. But when you have a true hot facet, when you can see uh, severe facet arthrosis, I think that is an absolute contraindication also for an artificial disc. Okay. Finally, I do think those cases with severe cord compromise, um, if you have signal changes in the cord, those also are ones that I would hesitate from doing an artificial disc. Not only because I think the fusion may help uh, with stabilizing the cord, but also if you even have any residual symptoms in the future, you're going to want to re-image the, the spinal canal. And due to the artificial disc and the materials in the artificial disc, a lot of times you will not be able to see what's happening to that spinal cord after you place an artificial disc. So I think that that's something to be very cognizant of.